This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to this Floracast episode on comparing organic substrates. In the last few years, I have noticed an increased interest from growers in using organic substrates for growing flower and vegetable transplants. This begs the question, what is an organic substrate? That is, a substrate or potting mix that is derived from naturally occurring substances and does not contain synthetic materials. So many of the ingredients that we already use in substrates are considered organic. These would include peat, sand, vermiculite, perlite, uh, composts that are prepared according to NOP guidelines, and then organic fertilizers. For certified organic production, the ingredients in an organic substrate must meet National Organic Program, or NOP, guidelines. In all cases, an operation should check with their organic certification agent so what is not organic about conventional potting mixes? In this table, we list the recipe for the conventional Cornell peat light mix. It calls for half a cubic yard of peat moss and half a cubic yard of coarse vermiculite with some various fertilizer and wetting agent amendments. The peat moss, vermiculite, and limestone are appropriate for organic use, but the synthetic fertilizers, triple superphosphate, potassium nitrate, and the micronutrient charge cannot be used as well, the conventional wetting agent would not be acceptable for organic use. The objective of the trial that I'm going to talk about that was conducted with my graduate student, Stephanie Beeks, was to trial several organic substrates for the growth effects on flower and vegetable transplants without additional fertilizers. In the trial, we wanted to look at a range of locally, regionally, and nationally available mixes and compare them to each other. We have noticed that, in particular, a lot of the organic vegetable transplant growers prefer mixes to be preloaded with a lot of nutrients that may carry the plant for four to six weeks of growth. Therefore, in the trial, we did not add additional fertilizer as we wanted to see how well growth would do using just the fertility from the mixes themselves. In the trial, we took plugs of tomato, pepper, pansy, petunia, and snapdragon seedlings and we transplanted these in four inch pots with which had various organic mixes. These pots were grown on for six weeks at a fairly warm greenhouse temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit and they were watered daily or as needed with tap water. In the trial we did not use any additional fertility. The substrates that we used in the trial included a Cornell organic mix this is one that we have prepared using a uh, peat, perlite, and vermicompost recipe that you can see here, where the vermicompost is supposed to supply the majority of the nutrients. As well, we use dolomitic limestone to add some calcium and magnesium and to increase the pH of the mix, as well as add green sand, rock phosphate, and blood meal to add additional N, P, and K. The other substrates that we used in the trial include sunshine, natural, and organic substrates number one and number four. Both of these are peat perlite based substrates with an organic starter charge. Two mixes from the Vermont Compost Company. One is their Fort Light, which contains peat, their compost, uh, perlite, and uh, several different sources of organic nutrients, as well as their Fort V, which is similar to Fort Light, but it does not contain perlite. We used a locally available uh, organic mix prepared in upstate New York that contains peat, compost, and a poultry litter fertilizer. Then from the Hudson Valley, we trialed McEnroe Organic Farm Premium Light Mix. This mix contains compost, peat, and perlite, as well as several sources of organic nutrients. Finally, from Sunshine, we also trialed their organic PX2 mix which besides peat and perlite contains quite a bit of bark as well as composted peanut shells. We tested the pH and the electrical conductivity of these mixes before planting. For potting mixes, the suggested pH before planting would be 5.5 to 6.5. Of the mixes that we trialed, the Sunshine number one and number four mixes, as well as the locally formulated mix, had pHs above the suggested range. The Cornell and the Fort Light mixes were slightly below the suggested range, and the rest of the mixes were within that suggested range. 
We also tested the pre-plant electrical conductivity, or EC, which is a total measure of the salts, which would include both fertilizer salts as well as non-fertilizer salts such as sodium and chloride. Of the mixes that we looked at, Cornell, Sunshine number no. 1 and Sunshine number no. 4, and the local mix uh, had relatively low saturated media extract EC values. The PX2 was roughly in the normal range, and the Fort Light, the Fort V, and the McEnroe, which were formulated with a large dose of organic nutrients, came in at the high end of the normal range. Next I will show a series of photos demonstrating the results of the plant growth trials after six weeks. For pepper, we noticed that the largest plants were found with the Fort Light, the locally prepared mix, and McEnroe mix. Uh, as well, the Cornell mix and the Fort V mix gave suitable plant growth. The Sunshine mixes, Sunshine 1 and Sunshine 4 and PX2, gave fairly small plant growth, and this was expected due to the low starter nutrient charge that was uh, added to these mixes. Tomato gave similar results, and one of the things that you can note here uh, low fertility shows as both uh, small plants, such as the Sunshine 1 and 4 mixes. So one of the take-home messages for tomato, which is a heavier feeder, while we can grow a large plant with some of these mixes that have a lot of organic fertilizer incorporated into the substrate, they will eventually run out of that fertilizer, uh, leading to nitrogen deficiency. For pansy, we did not include the PX2 mix in this trial. We noted that the McEnroe, the Fort V, the Fort Light, and the locally prepared mixes gave the largest plants. Cornell mix the second largest, and Sunshine 1 and number 4, somewhat smaller plants. For Snapdragon, we found that the locally prepared mix was not at all suitable for growing Snapdragons. This was potentially due to a high ammonium charge in the compost that was used in that mix. For petunia plants, it was a similar story, with the largest plants coming from Fort V, McEnroe, Fort Light, as well the local mix was suitable for petunia production. Uh, Medium-sized plants from the Cornell mix, and smaller plants from the Sunshine 1 and 4 mixes. One of the things that's very evident from this picture is that the new growth of the plants exhibits iron deficiency from many of the substrates. This shows up as yellowing between the veins on these upper leaves. Therefore, one thing to take into account when using any potting mix, whether it's conventional or organic, is the starting pH and starting limestone charge of the mix. Depending on your water's alkalinity, you may need to use a mix that has a lower limestone charge. In the previous trial, we noticed that the sunshine mixes were prepared with only a starter nutrient charge, that is, they were not intended to supply all of the nutrients for crop growth. Therefore, we wanted to test one of the mixes, Sunshine number no. 4, and trial two different organic fertilizer sources. First, we conducted a trial with Sustain 844. Sustain is a poultry litter and hydrolyzed feather meal based uh, certified organic product. The other organic fertility source that we tried was Worm Power Vermicompost which has a lower nutrient charge than the sustain, so we used it at higher incorporation rates. We used it at 0, 5, 10, 20, or 30% by volume incorporated into the substrate before transplanting. For the sustain trial, we noticed that for pepper, about 5 pounds per cubic yard gave the best growth, and any additional uh, applied sustain did not uh, increase the amount of growth by the plant. For tomato, which is a heavier feeder, we noticed that about 10 pounds per cubic yard uh, gave good growth of the plant. In the vermicompost trial, for tomatoes, which are a heavier feeder, we noticed that at least 10% of the vermicompost by volume, and really up to 20%, uh, gave very nice, well-fertilized plants with less symptoms of nutrient deficiency. From the trial, we came away with several take-home lessons. One is to check with your supplier to determine the amount of nutrient charge in the substrate. Is the substrate intended to carry the plant for four to six weeks from the fertility that's loaded up into it, or is the fertility that's added intended to serve as only a starter charge to carry the plant for the first week or two after transplanting? 
Other lessons that we learned are that we recommend getting a laboratory media test done on your materials uh, before you plant into them. Another lesson is to monitor the electrical conductivity or the EC. This can be done both pre-plant with the laboratory media tests or, or at-home tests um, and can also be done throughout the, the growth cycle as well. Mixes preloaded with heavy nutrients will have a high EC and you will need to be careful with salt sensitive seedlings. If you monitor EC throughout the experiment, uh, low and decreasing EC is going to suggest low nutrients and, and the amount of nutrients will be declining over time. Finally, if you monitor pH over time, uh, this will also be useful. We found that compost and other organic fertilizer sources such as poultry litter can raise the pH. A couple final notes are that organic producers should always consult their certification agents before purchasing and using product. Always conduct your own in-house trials before using new materials at full production scale. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.